Well, good morning and a blessed Sabbath to you today in Cornerstone from me here in Cookstown, Northern Ireland. Uh, once again, can we thank the, the leadership in Cookstown and Cornerstone for asking me to come and do these meetings. It's a privilege to, uh, to speak to you uh, from the Word of God. And we trust that the Lord will impart some spiritual gifts to you uh, this Sabbath day morning. We're going to open in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the return of your day. We bless thee for a day of rest, a day that we can come and recharge our physical batteries, but more importantly, a day of worship, a day that we can come and bow before thee, time specifically set aside to honour thee and to give recognition of all that you have done in our life. And Lord, we're so blessed by thee. We thank you, Lord, for every temporal blessing, every, every daily blessing that we receive, the clothes that are on our back and the food that are on our table. We thank you for roofs over our heads. We thank you, Lord, for jobs, for family, for so many happy things in life. And Lord, we even thank you for the things which we don't perceive to be happy. We thank you for the trials. We thank you for the valleys. We thank you for the challenges which we face, knowing, Lord, that for us who are called According to your purposes, all things will work together for good. We thank you, Lord, for the sovereign plan of God in our lives. We thank you that you have a plan for each and every one of your children, a plan that is uh, supremely suited to them and to their situation, and a plan through which they can not only uh, achieve fulfillment in their own life, but a plan by which they will be able to bring honour and glory to thee and help every believer both in Cornerstone and also here in Cookstown to find that plan and to be in the very centre of that plan and we pray that you will bless them and Lord that you will lead them and guide them and help them in the daily challenges of life and the decision that they have to make. We pray that you will give them wisdom that you'll guide them with their eye. We thank you Lord for our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the one who is the way that guides us and is the truth that we can stand on and the one who is the life. And Lord, we would be spiritually dead. Uh, we would be eternally dead if it were not for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the Prince of Life. We thank you for the one who laid down his life uh, and yet took it again in such a glorious fashion, dying and rising in power, resurrecting, uh, from the tomb. We bless thee for our Saviour. We thank you for the redemption that he purchased uh, in his life and his death. We thank you, Lord, for the intercession uh, that he performs in his resurrected uh, glory and in his eternal life. And we thank you, Lord, uh, that he ever lives to make intercession for his people and that through Christ and Christ alone, we have a way into the presence of the Father. Oh, Lord, come and bless our meeting this morning. May it be a time of worship. May it be a time of instruction. May it be a time of joy. Help us, Lord, to afflict our hearts. Help us to search our hearts. Help us, Lord, to uh, search our lives, to, uh, to see if there be some, uh, something in our life that displeases thee and hinders the work and hinders our prayers. Cleanse us, Lord. Cleanse us afresh in the precious blood. And we pray for those that know not the Saviour in this meeting. We pray that you'll speak powerfully to them and draw them to the foot of the old rugged cross. Give them faith and repentance. And Lord, do that work which only the Holy Spirit can do. So bless us now and bless the church in Cornerstone. I pray you'll build it up. We pray, Lord, that you will... Uh, Lord, that you will protect it. Bless Pastor Ferguson. Uh, bless the whole of the leadership team. We pray that you will help those that do any work uh, in regard to that church, practical or spiritual, that you will bless them. And may they know favour and prosperity uh, because of their, their sacrifice for thee. Add on to the church such as should be saved. Save souls. Build up believers. Send revival. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to read the Word of God from the book of Psalms. We'll just have a short reading this time. A uh, very well-known Psalm, Psalm 127. Psalm 127. Only five verses. So let's read them. Uh, we can take our time and we can th uh, read them thoughtfully as, uh, as we progress down through this Psalm. Psalm 127, verse 1. 
except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it, except the Lord keep the city. The watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early and sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, <clears throat> children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Amen. And we know and we anticipate that God will bless the public reading of his word. I'd like you to put yourself in a situation or imagine yourself in a situation. You're a Bible college student you've been called by the lord into full-time christian service and currently you're in bible college studying to go on to go into that service you're married you have a family uh, you and your wife have part-time jobs uh, well you're you have a part-time job brother and your wife is full-time employed and so you have money coming into the household to help you support or to support you in your, uh, in, in your Bible college years. You have a house which you purchased before you went into Bible college, which you uh, purchased before you were called. You have ongoing bills, all of which you had before going into Bible college. It's the summer. The college uh, semesters have finished. You've got a break over the summer and you have the offer of an assistant ship in pastoring a distant church. Now it is distant. It's not near at all. It's not convenient. There's no way that you can travel to that church from your home. Now there may be a door open for you in that church to future ministry. You may in the future time, if you take this assistantship over the summer, in the future you may get a call to that church to minister, or you may not. If you decide to take this assistantship over the summer, it'll mean that you will lose both your jobs. And the pay which you'll receive as an assistant of this church is not nearly enough to pay the bills. Nor is it nearly enough to uh, give you the first term of your Bible college bills for the next year. What are you going to do? Are you going to go? Are you going to go and take this assistantship and trust God to provide for you, knowing that you may not have enough money, but there may be a door open for you at the end of your study here? Or do you stay? Do you stay go and say that God has provided for me here, my calling is to Bible, uh, Bible college first, and God give us our jobs that supplies uh, the money and supplies, the, uh, supplies our needs. So I'm going to stay here in the place that God has supplied. What do you do? It's a very, very difficult decision, and it's a real situation. A situation that actually happened to a pastor, or a man who is now a pastor, and the pastor who was in that situation, he chose to go. He felt that God was calling him, definitely calling him to that place, and that God would open a door to that place at the end of his study. And even though common sense said, stay, stay in the place where God is prepared for you, he felt he had a word from God. And therefore he went against what would be common sense. And God did meet his need, even though his wife and himself both lost their jobs. God did meet his need. Now, I tell you that story because it's a remarkable situation to a situation that I was in personally myself. I had just finished Bible college and I was licensed to be called to the ministry of the Free Presbyterian Church. <clears throat> and I was offered a short-term placement. 
perhaps at the end of that placement, uh, I would have an opportunity to get a call to that place. But I had a wife, and have a wife, should I say, <laughs> and a family. I have a home, a house, I had a mortgage, I had bills, and I had jobs. I had a part-time job, and my wife had a full-time job. And if I had taken that part-time uh, placement in that far off place, I would have lost my job and my wife would have lost her job. Um, and I did the very opposite to the pastor that I've just told you about. I made my decision on the same basis as the pastor did. Uh, common sense said stay, but that pastor had a word from God to go, so he went and God supplied. To me, common sense said, uh, said stay, but I didn't have a word from God to go. And I didn't feel the call of God to that place, so I stayed. And God opened another door. And that brings a big question to our minds. Uh, on Wednesday night, we began a short series on living by faith. And I want to continue that series today. And the question that comes to our mind is, how do faith and common sense fit together? Where does faith begin and common sense end? Or, or, or should we even think, think about it like that at all? I want you to think today about faith and wisdom or, or common sense, because that's, that's pretty much what uh, wisdom is. It's common sense. Com uh, COVID-19 has focused our attention on this question of faith versus common sense. I was watching a video of a street preacher in Belfast and he was preaching the gospel and he was preaching the gospel very faithfully and very well and all credit to him for that. But he was challenged because he wasn't wearing a mask. And what he said was the answer that he, he gave to the person who challenged him was, I have a faith mask. My faith protects me. Well, was he right? Was he living by faith? Or had he abandoned common sense? And how do faith and common sense fit together? The debate over, well, in Northern Ireland, there has been a great debate over the closure of church buildings because of the spread of COVID-19. And some say it's common sense to close the church buildings because of the health risk. Some say it's a lack of faith. After all, in the first century, in the first century Christian church, Christians were Christians died for their faith. And they say, well, should we not be willing to go to church and lose our life? It's a big question. How, do, how does faith and common sense fit together, if they do fit together? Now, some people, some people say they don't fit together at all. Some Christians say there's no need for common sense. Some Christians say, well, for, for we walk by faith and not by sight. And they'll tell you that the Bible doesn't say that the just shall live by common sense. They'll quote Hebrews 10, verse 38. They'll say the just shall live by faith, and therefore we don't need common sense at all. They'll say without faith, uh, there's no pleasing God. And therefore, we live totally by faith and we, we dispense with common sense. Martin Luther said reason is a whore. It's a pretty strong words. Reason is a whore, the greatest enemy that faith has. Although I have to say, I don't think that he was asking us to abandon common sense. Because Luther was one of the most logical men ever. But there, there are people today, Christians, who almost despise living by common sense. They, they, they tell us, they insist that they are constantly led by the Holy Spirit in some sort of mystical way. And then at the very opposite end of the scale, there are other people and their lives are so calculated that they hardly ever refer to the promises of God. They, they hardly ever refer to the will of God. 
They're at the other end of the scale. So what's the, what's the right path? Where do faith and common sense cross, if they cross at all? Well, first, let's go back to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Let's say this in the first place. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith is necessary in every situation, all the time. We're here to live by faith all the time. And every situation must have an element of faith to it. If we approach a situation just by common sense, we're wrong. The just shall live by faith. Every interaction must be seasoned with the salt of faith. That's the first thing. Faith is always required. But the second thing is common sense is also absolutely essential. You see, the Bible might not say the just shall live by common sense. It doesn't say that. But it says it in plenty of other ways. Yeah. If you go to the book of Proverbs, written by the wisest man that ever lived apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, King Solomon, proverb after proverb after proverb tells us to, to strive for knowledge, to gain understanding, to gain wisdom, to, uh, to exercise discretion, to, to use prudence. In other words, common sense. We're to strive to live in a common sense way. The book of Proverbs is full of that. I could turn you to, to, to uh, verse after verse to prove that. And after all, common sense is just simply good judgment. A common sense person is someone who looks at the situation and sees what's really going on and makes a good judgment or a good decision based on that. It's common sense that tells us to put our coat on when it's raining. It's common sense that tells us to put uh, our ice cream into the freezer rather than just into the cupboard. It's common sense that tells us to insure our property against, against fire, against burglary, and against other dangers. And the Bible is very clear that common sense wisdom is worth seeking after. So if the Bible says that we're to live by faith and we're to live by common sense, then the two of those things are not enemies. Common sense and faith are allies. They're friends. They're not foes. They don't, they don't contradict one another. In fact, they complement one another. You see, true faith and I want to say this very carefully, and I'm going to explain it in a moment. True faith is always aligned with common sense. There's a great preacher called Oswald Chambers, and he said, faith in opposition to common sense, or faith without common sense, is mistaken enthusiasm and narrow-mindedness. But he went on to say that common sense in opposition to faith or common sense without faith demonstrates a mistaken reliance on reason as the basis of faith. In other words, common sense and faith are allies. They're friends. They're not foes. And you'll notice, you'll notice in that quote that I said from Oswald Chambers that he said the word mistaken twice over. If you have faith without common sense, that's a mistake. And if you have common sense without faith, that's a mistake. There's an old Arabic proverb which says, trust in God and tie up your camel. And I think it's brilliant. That's exactly how you and I ought to live. We ought to trust God to keep our camel safe, but we ought to tie the camel up because common sense tells us that it wants to run away. God does protect his people, but part of his protection is giving us common sense. God doesn't do for us things which we can do for ourselves. God covers the things which we can't do 
but he expects us to use his own given common sense to do what we can. And the Bible's full of that sort of thinking. You think about Joseph. Joseph. Joseph is a, an excellent example of faith and common sense working hand in hand. By faith, Joseph saw that there was going to be seven lean years. God showed him that. And by faith, he, by faith, he trusted God's word and saw that there was going to be seven lean years. He saw the reality of the situation, what was really going to happen. And then common sense made him make preparation. And by the way, God, it doesn't say in the scriptures that God told Joseph what to instruct Pharaoh to do. Joseph gave Pharaoh common sense advice. Pharaoh, there's going to be seven lean years. There's going to be seven good years first, followed by seven lean years. So you've got to build barns. And you've got to fill, you've got to fill those barns during the first seven years. Joseph gave him common sense advice. Yeah? Faith and common sense working hand in hand. And as I've said before on uh, previous occasions, preparing for hard times and preparing for persecution is preparing in faith. Yeah. We did a series in Gideon with you some weeks back. And it's clear to see in Gideon's life, common sense and faith working hand in hand. God said to Gideon, I want you to go and pull down the altar of Baal. And Gideon went by night. He went at night so that he wouldn't be interrupted. He went at night so that he would get the job done. And Gideon didn't expect to get away with it. He didn't go by night to, uh, to try and get away with it. He didn't expect to get away with it. Yeah, Gideon knew he was going to be caught. He did it by night to get the job done. He used a common sense approach. God told Gideon that he was going to win the, the battle with 300 men. And Gideon then made common sense decisions. He divided his, com his company into three groups. He gave them lamps and pots and common sense. And he said, uh, and he, he, he used a common sense approach. Common sense and faith are friends. They're allies. They're not enemies. We read that wonderful Psalm, Psalm 127, and the first verse of it says, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city. And notice this. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. You see, faith says pray for the city's protection, because without God's protection, the watchman will not wake or will wake in vain. Faith says pray for the city's protection, but common sense says put a watchman on the wall. There's no conflict there. There's no conflict between faith and common sense. They're perfectly in harmony. So when you're making a choice, folks, give both faith and common sense their place. First, seek what faith will say to you. First, listen to the word of faith. That's the first thing. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you're making a decision, seek out from the word of God if it is anything to say. And then after that, think about your decision practically. Analyze it by common sense. If it's not a situation where the word of God has anything to say, then use common sense. Okay? If God's... if you. If the decision that you're making uh, has, if the word of God says nothing about it, then just operate on common sense. But pray, pray, exercise faith, even in that situation. Plan, prepare for the decision and pray. Plan and prepare as if it all depends on you and pray knowing that it all depends on God. Because you see, there's a, there's a certain drawback to common sense. Our common sense is only as good as we can see the reality of the situation. If there are real factors which we can't see, we won't make a common sense decision. And therefore we need to pray that the Lord will even keep his hand upon us 
in common sense decisions. A great example of that, of course, is the Titanic, the great ship that was built over here in Northern Ireland and Belfast, ship that the whole world knows about. At 20 minutes to midnight on the 14th of April 1912, the Titanic was struck by an iceberg. And there's been a debate about that ever since. One part of the debate about the sinking of the Titanic is should the captain of the Titanic or the first officer of the Titanic who had made the decision, should he have allowed a head-on collision or should he have done what he did, which was to try and steer out of the way? You see, that on that fateful night, the ship's lookout spotted an iceberg ahead and he sounded the alarm and the first officer, a man by the name of Mr. Murdoch, made a choice. He gave the command to turn to port and to stop all engines. And his hope was that he would slow the vessel down and that he would avoid a collision. That seemed to be a common sense choice. But it was a wrong choice. In fact, it was a fatal choice, the fatal choice, because he didn't see all the real danger. The real danger was not above the water. The real danger was below the water, because two-thirds of the iceberg were beneath the water. They were invisible to him. He had sensed, he had sensed by what he could see that the safe option was to try and steer out of the way. But had he seen the danger beneath the water, he would have realized that the safer option would be to allow the boat to have a head-on collision. The investigation afterwards shows that if he had hit the, the iceberg straight on, there would have been injuries. There would have been many, many injuries. They calculate that about 90 feet of the front of the ship would have, been, would have just crumpled and of course people inside that would have been killed. The ship would have come to a very sudden stop and people inside would have been tossed around and there would have been injuries uh, like that. There would have doubtless been serious injuries, but it's probable that 1,500 people wouldn't have been killed. Mr. Murdoch made a common sense choice based upon what he could see. But he, the problem was he couldn't see it all. And our common sense is only as good as our senses. What we can see, what we can hear, what we can detect. And that's why I say that everything must be done in faith. You come to a decision, the Bible doesn't say anything about it. You proceed with common sense. But recognize humbly that we can't see everything. So plan and prepare, but pray. Commit it to God. Recognize that God can see the two-thirds of the iceberg that's under the water that you can't see. And ask for his mercy and ask for his grace. Recognizing that he knows a whole lot more than we do. Commit it to him by faith. Now, in the vast majority of times, and I, I believe this very strongly, in the vast majority of times, God's will turns out to be the common sense approach. I worked with a man who was very skeptical of Christians and he was skeptical of churches. And he asked me a question one day. He said, why do ministers only take calls to bigger churches? He says, ha, that's a scam. That's a setup. He says, all it is is a promotion game. And the answer that I give him was that God usually works by common sense. God calls men to smaller places where they learn, and then he leads them to bigger places that are more difficult to handle. Not always, but usually God's will follows the common sense, or what we would see as the common sense approach. So we should expect God's will to follow common sense. <laughs> but the situations, the situations where God's will made people do things that didn't seem to be sensible at all. I mean, that pastor, that pastor who gave up his job, that, did, that wasn't a common sense or a give up his, his jobs and went to the, to the summer placement. That wasn't a common sense approach. 
No. What about Peter? When P God asked Peter to climb out of the boat and walk on the water, common sense would tell us that a fully grown man cannot walk on top of the water. Ha! <laughs> Peter's faith went against common sense. Well, not so fast. Just not so fast. You see, common sense is the ability to see the real situation and act. And it is the word of God that establishes what is real. Now, this is the key. Let me, under, let, let me underline that. It is the word of God that establishes what is real. You see, the word of God says that if you step off a boat, you sink. It's the word of God that says that men can't walk on water. How do I know that? Because Peter told me. Turn with me over to 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. And Peter says, For this, in verse 5, they are willingly ignorant of that the word of God, or rather that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Peter says that it's the word of God that made the dry land stand out of the water. And it was by the word of God that the people perished in the flood. The people in Noah's day found out to their, uh, to their detriment that you cannot walk on water. Why? Because the word of God made it so. It says whereby, in other words, by the word of God, the world being overflown, overflowed. The word of God wrote the law that says you and I can't walk on water. Don't think about the word of God as being separate from reality. The word of God establishes reality. The word of God defines what is real. The word of God established this world and every reality in it. And when the word of God says that you and I can't walk on water, that's what sets the fact that we can't walk on water. But when the word of God, through the mouth of Jesus Christ, said to Peter to come on the water, God's word changed reality. God's word made the impossible possible. And common sense changed with it. It became the common sense thing to get out of the boat. Because Christ had changed reality by his word. And the water was now solid. It's only when Peter started to doubt the word of God that he sank. You see, folks, when God speaks about a situation, that is what is real. God's word is more solid than every reality we see around us. When God called that pastor, when God gave that pastor a word directing him to go to the summer placement, God's word put in place realities that would meet his need. And God's provision was more solid. God's provision in that summer placement in that faraway church was more solid than the jobs that he and his wife had, which they had to leave. It was then common sense to trust God. Obeying God's word was the solid option even though it felt like stepping out of the boat onto the sea. But be very, very careful, folks, in these situations that you have a genuine word from God. If you're faced with a choice, number one, seek God's word, and then seek what you believe is the common sense approach. And if God's word say, has nothing to say, then proceed carefully on common sense and proceed prayerfully. Ask God in faith for mercy and for grace, remembering the iceberg. 
remembering humbly that we don't see everything and ask him in faith to step in if we are wrong. And if God's word does say something about what you're deciding, expect God's word to follow the common sense. And if the two correspond, if God's word to you and common sense correspond, follow that, take it, run with it, act on it. Because God is a God of wisdom. God is a God of order. God is a God of common sense. And if the word that you have from God seems to contradict common sense, be sure that you actually have a word from God. And if you're sure, if you're certain that the word which God has given you is, is, is right and true, then step out of the boat and walk on that water. Because if God has spoken to you, he will create a reality that will support you. He will. But permit me to say this. Don't step out of the boat unless you're sure. Don't go against common sense unless you are sure you have a word from God. You see, common sense is the safety check. Common sense is the safety check against wrong interpretation. Plenty of people read God's word and they read things into God's word that are not there. Plenty of people say, God told me to do this and God did nothing of the sort. God gives us common sense as a safety check against that. If the guidance that you think God has given you is not common sense, be careful. Make doubly sure that God is speaking to you. And if you're sure, go with the word of God. Step out of that uh, boat and God will make reality work around his word. Peter knew that God was speaking to him. The word was unmistakable. Christ said, come, come to me in the water. And Peter stepped out in faith and the sea felt like a slab of granite beneath him because God changed reality to match his word. So the procedure is simple. I have a choice to make. Number one, what does God say? What does the book say? Number two, what does common sense say? If God's word doesn't say anything, then take the common sense approach. And take it carefully and take it prayerfully, knowing that we can't see everything. If God's word matches common sense, then go right ahead. Take it and run with it. If God's word is against the common sense approach, go slow and be careful. Be careful. Make sure God's word actually says what you think it says. And if you're certain, if you have a word of God, word from God rather, go ahead. Even if it goes against common sense. Because God's word defines what reality is. Go ahead and step out of that boat and walk on the water. May God help us to balance faith and wisdom, faith and common sense as we live for him by faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the word of God. We thank you, Lord, for even the simple illustrations like the psalm that we have just read. Lord, we acknowledge the need to pray that you will protect the city of our lives. But Lord, we also acknowledge the need that we need in common sense to set watchmen on the walls. Help us as, as your people to be able to balance the two. Help us, Lord, to do everything by faith. And even when we approach things in a common sense way, help us humbly to realize that we can't see all the factors and to look to thee by faith to guide and protect. And then, Lord, give us discernment in those difficult decisions and especially in the decisions where you will lead us to do things that might not seem common sense. Give us confidence in your word. Give us the ability to read your word and to search the scriptures. And Lord, we pray that you'll speak powerfully to us and lead your people. Lead your people in Cornerstone. Lead your people in Cookstown to live by faith for thee. We ask these things in the Savior's precious name. Amen. Once again, we thank you. We thank you for listening in. And we trust that this has been a blessing and an instruction to your heart. May God bless you all.